This video is part one of my coverage of chapter 13, Yoga and the Hindu Tradition, for PSY 230, Personality Theory. In this chapter, you will be starting to cover um, a series of three uh, approaches to importing and kind of looking through the lens of a variety of alternate traditions. Most of personality theory as it is traditionally taught in the United States, comes from a Western European and then American psychology point of view. Most of our theorists are white. Most of our theorists are men. Um, we've looked at two perspectives that were um, uh, coming from primarily the voices of women, um, most of whom were white. Um, so we have a problem in uh, personality theory uh, historically with a very, very biased viewpoint. Um, in recent years, and by recent years I mean in the last uh, 30 to 40 years, some have argued that we can learn a great deal from so-called Eastern traditions such as uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Sufism uh, because for, you know, from an implied standpoint, many um, therapists have found that practices uh, such as yoga and meditation practices coming from both from all three the Hindu Buddhist and Sufist traditions can be useful for helping people to get unstuck helping them to reduce their depression and anxiety helping them to discover more about themselves and to feel uh, better so there's that applied side um, but there's also uh, you know a, a a, a number of theorists and writers within personality who really looked at faith traditions as an alternative way to think about personality and growth and development. So we're going to start um, by looking at yoga and the Hindu tradition. When we think about yoga, um, yoga is uh, many things. There, It should be yogas. There are many different traditions within this chapter, and one of the things that students sometimes tell me is frustrating about this chapter is just how many yogas do I have to learn? Um, well, you're learning the surface of several different approaches um, in yoga. Let's start by just sort of grounding ourselves in what does the Hindu tradition mean by the word yoga? Yoga is a Sanskrit word. Um, that is typically uh, defined in you know, English language as joining or union. Um, it's often used as a verb form um, to join or to unite. Uh, and you should keep that in mind as we go forward. The goal of yoga practice, regardless of which type of yoga you're looking at, um, is self-realization and self-discovery its growth. So in it, what you'll find as we move through this chapter, you'll be making some connections to the arguments made by Maslow and Rogers, and to some extent Karen Horney, um, who talked about self-realization. Uh, granted, she was doing so from a psychoanalytic standpoint, but you will, will be able to make some connections to other theorists that we've studied so far in this class. Yoga also, if you're looking at translations, but also just the uses of the word um, in Hinduism, also refers to a method, a practice. Um, so what you're, you'll see this also in um, when we talk about Zen Buddhism and Sufism as well, that there are prescriptive methodologies that people are taught to cultivate changes in their state of consciousness, changes in their awareness, changes in their control of their physical being. And it's assumed that that is a way for people to acquire self-realization. You'll also hear the word technology used. Um, and when, when we talk about yoga technology, they're not talking about you know machines. They're talking about practice. They're talking about method that leads the person um, to uh, occupying kind of a mental space that makes self-realization or blissful uh, illumination more possible. 
to start understanding yoga, and I, I should make I should have made this on the first slide, just a, an opening caveat. Um, I am not an expert in Eastern religion or Eastern history and tradition um, by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a personality social psychologist, and my focus is on how have Western psychologists, so psychologists in Western Europe, in North America, how have they used um, ideas coming from, in this case, Hinduism, to understand human nature better? Um, so it's with that particularity in mind. If you took courses from our faculty in religion, you would get a different perspective on, on Hinduism. So uh, the basic principles of creation, uh, and I will apologize in advance for my pronunciation issues, um, Prakriti refers to um, a primal, natural state of being or a, a primal creative energy that all people are assumed to have. There's an assumption that um, this Prakriti is our original intended state of being. Um, and life, you know, living life in the bodies that we have ten, can tend to modify that. It can push us away from it or toward it. It can modify how it's being experienced. Prakriti is divided up into three primary components or principles, and they're referred to as the three gunas. Um, and, you know, when I look at these, I think of, you know, how in psychology we tend to talk about behavior, cognition, and emotion. Um, in, the, in Hindu tradition, rajas refers to action, to taking action. Um, the sattva is the illuminated state. It's this uh, higher state of awareness and understanding. The tamas is the being grounded and stuck, um, not grounded in a positive way. It's, it refers to inertia um, as a state of being. It's assumed that the three gunas function in union at our best when we are functioning at our highest possibility. There's a seamless uh, relationship between the three gunas. Um, at our worst, we have imbalance. Um, so kind of think back to how Carl Jung argued that what we are seeking in terms of our positive functions is balance. Ultimately, we need to have balance among our competing, sometimes contradictory elements of personality. And Hinduism is making a similar argument. These various aspects or manifestations of nature, um, they, they have you know, as they manifest themselves, they, they are composed of different balances, different levels of each of the three gunas. Um, next, I'm going to play you the first of several um, videos that I've added to the presentation, just so you're aware. It's difficult to get embedded videos to have high quality um, audio. So you may find that it's easier for you to toggle back and forth uh, between the inserted videos and the PowerPoint lecture. Understanding the mind, uh, you know, the mind is vast and uh, it can hold innumerable thoughts and it can move beyond our speed of recognition. So how do we understand ourselves with our mind? In Ayurveda, we talk about this um, same way we do with, in yoga technology which is around understanding what we call the mahagunas, or the supreme qualities or attributes in the mind, um, sattva, rajas, and tamas. In Ayurvedic medicine, I think the most useful tool is to understand how to become more sattvic. And oftentimes, if we're feeling tamasic, or a heavy, dull quality, the concept of sattva is beyond our ability to really understand or conceptualize, because we're feeling heavy and dark and stuck you know, for me, when I get really ambivalent about things, um, I'm in my tamas sort of uh, uh, goo, if you will. And so the way out of tamas, yoga explains this as well, is through rajas. You're going to have to create some friction or some heat. Um, I always tell students what I was taught in Ayurvedic school, which is if there's a problem with being stuck, like a, a boulder stuck, we're not going to move it by just kicking it. We're going to have to rock it back and forth a little bit. 
we've got to get some motion, right? Some friction before we're going to get out of the jam. We aren't just going to all of a sudden fly that boulder up and it's going to be able to have movement. We're going to have to move it slowly and then eventually the more pressure we apply back and forth, then we're going to begin to get its own aspect of motion stimulated and we'll get movement. So the way to move out of a very stuck and steady, hard or uh, ambivalent position is through cultivating movement, which in and of itself is rajas. So. Moving out of tamas, it's useful to cultivate rajas, but with a sattvic attitude. So I think she does a great job of explaining in words that are understandable and relatable the, un, the assumptions about how uh, tamas, sattva, and rajas are supposed to interact when we are in a healthy state of mind. Um, to back up a bit, there is a the, an assumption in Hinduism that everything is composed of matter and can move through these three basic stages of existence or principles of nature. Um, they can be inert, they can be um, illuminated, they can be energetic. Um, and what we're seeking is balance. Another way of putting this, if you're thinking about the three stages of existence, is that everything is created, everything stays for a period of time, but inevitably everything made of matter is going to go away, is going to be destroyed. So these three phases of existence are assumed to correspond to the, the three gunas, the, the qualities that we experience the world through. Um, so some other words that you can use to think about these, uh, in the video she talks about rajas as, as movement, as something that can create friction. You can also use the word passion or emotion, um, because rajas is what um, drives that kind of, of emotional um, connection to movement. Goodness or sattva or illumination is a more cognitivist state. It's about having a calm, clear mind with a certain degree of objectivity that can rise above the sheer passion and action of the rajas. The tamas is assumed to be a state of lack of awareness that can be destructive. So when we are stuck, when we are heavy, when we are inert, we are living essentially in a state of lack of awareness, of uh, ignorance of the goodness, the clarity, the calmness that we could have, and how do we get out of it? As she says in the video, in order to escape tamas, you have to engage rajas and do so with a clarity of mind that is growth oriented. So to review these principles of creation, when we think of sattva, you think of a word like balance and p positivity and clarity and harmony. When you think of rajas, you can think of passion and excitement, energy and activity. When you think of tamas, you can think of inactivity, negativity, apathy. You, you can even layer on you know, words like depression, but I don't think it's necessary to go there necessarily. For people who are kind of not growing for people who are just in an average state rajas and tamas may be the, our predominant um, experiences you know think about how you've been feeling over the last three years you probably have these moments of stuckness and sadness and inactivity and then bursts of movement activity and energy what you're missing is is quite a lot of uh, the, the sattva state. So um, when, when we want to see people more developed, when we want to see them growing, they will also have a highly developed awareness or sattva that is able to balance the other two. Um, now for some psychologists coming from a Western tradition, they see some similarities here with um, the, the psychoanalytic tradition in some ways, uh, sattva being in some ways related to the Freudian idea of the superego, but definitely not with the critical, hard-edged, judgmental quality that Freud 
gave it. Um, the, the tamas being a frozen state of ego inactivity and the rajas being kind of a raw, id-like um, state of energy. But in the Hindu tradition, you don't have these assumptions of judgment. You know, for Freud, he saw the id as immoral, as basically sociopathic. Um, you don't see that kind of judgment being laid on, layered on here um, in the Hindu tradition. Emotions were rajas and, and what are described as, as bodily based drives can, when they are out of balance and not kind of guided by sattva, can lead to distortions of understanding. And it can make our understanding of our experience less clear, less aware. Um, so the goal of yoga practice is to decrease both the prominence of rajas and tamas and to allow for more clarity, more harmony, more positivity. Uh, so in other words, to increase sattvic awareness. How does this tradition think about consciousness? You know, you've, you've studied the psychoanalytic way of, of thinking about consciousness. You've, you've dabbled in a little bit of William James and his ideas about consciousness. And we've just finished talking about the humanistic approach in the yoga traditions, you have the mind uh, or consciousness, um, sometimes referred to as citta, that embraces all of our cognitive abilities, all of our cognitive processes, um, our, our awareness, our knowledge, um, all of that. Yoga, uh, and, and you know, when your authors talk about, or the, the woman in the video said, you know, our technology, yoga involves learning to control the mind's flow. Um, so, you know, if you go back to uh, William James, he did talk about uh, how it is that some people have these capacities to um, move into different kinds of consciousness. And ba essentially, yoga is one of the practices that makes it possible for people to modify their state of consciousness. Um, the goal is, you know, to bring a more sattvic state of calm and inner peace um, through focusing one's attention on the experience of the self. Now, notice the capital S on self. This isn't like ego just living in the world wanting a whole bunch of attention. It's the capital S self that is sattvic, that is grown, that is growing uh, and developing. Um, there is this uh, concept of waves of consciousness that are moving through the self um, and that can, when they are driven primarily through uh, tamas and uh, rajas, they become overwhelming and they can um, limit awareness of the self. Uh, so when we are you know, filled with angry energy or anxious energy, the waves of consciousness can literally freeze us in our tracks and obscure wisdom um, and make us, you know, very unhappy and, and unsettled. So what yoga seeks to do is to quiet those waves of consciousness. Think about a time when you were just overwhelmed by fear and anxiety and you couldn't quiet those anxious um, thoughts. Um, as they just wave through your mind and keep you unsettled, interfering with your sleep, interfering with your ability to work, uh, to focus, and so on. What you're, you're experiencing according to the yoga tradition is your waves of consciousness obscuring the self. So what yoga practice is designed to do is to quiet those waves of consciousness, reduce rajas and tamas, and allow sattvic energy to become more prominent. Now, karma is a concept that, you know, from a Western perspective is routinely misdefined and uh, not understood properly. We tend in Western culture to talk about karma and its effect as some sort of co cosmic balancing for bad behavior. If people do really bad things, they're going to get karma in the end and really bad things are going to happen to them. Um, 
and, and vice versa. If you're doing really good, good things, karma should reward you. That's really not what karma is about um, in the yoga tradition. Karma um, means action and results. You know, all, all actions are assumed to have consequences. Um, now, you know, that part makes sense with our traditional Western way of using the word karma, but it deviates where we have to add the assumption that um, the life you are living right now in Hinduism is just a temporary state. There are, uh, consciousness is assumed to uh, flow across lifespans. So there is an assumption of past lives that people have, and the past experiences, the past actions of those past lives can continue to influence your current state through subconscious tendencies. So in the graphic, um, you have subconscious tendencies that can influence waves of consciousness that can then bias us in the direction of certain kinds of actions, and those actions create new or reinforce old subconscious tendencies. So what yoga is supposed to do is to uh, give us a measure of sattvic control over those subconscious tendencies. If you want to avoid the creation of new subconscious tendencies or exacerbating old ones, um, the, the first recommendation is that you don't act on your subconscious tendencies. So let's say you're being currently overwhelmed by um, anxious subconscious tendencies, creating waves of anxious anxiety and fear um, uh, around you, and then um, you, you think, what do I do when I'm afraid? I run away. So the first recommendation is not acting out those subconscious tendencies and looking at them, looking at the subconscious and looking at the waves of consciousness as they are flowing um, with wisdom and more of that sattvic point of view. So what the yogi learns to do, and this will remind you of cognitive behavioral therapy, what the yogi, yogi learns to do is to replace the negative subconscious tendencies, the waves of consciousness that are destructive with positive constructive actions um, that will challenge and go against those destructive habits that we may have engaged in in the past. And that moves people developmentally in a more positive direction. So long-term positive change results from habits of the mind altering subconscious tendencies that interfere with growth and that allows people to grow and uh, through these transformed states of consciousness. A little more about the subconscious tendencies. Um, it's assumed that you can gain control over waves of consciousness um, only if you can go at the subconscious tendencies. So again, this, is, this has echoes to me of what we do in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is you catch thoughts that are counterproductive. You catch them midstream as they're flowing through your mind, and you interrogate them and refute them and then replace them. A very similar suggestion is being made here, um, where we are taught to identify subconscious tendencies for what they are, which is elements of karma that are it now currently interfering with our capacity for growth. Um, so the samskaras have to be identified, confronted, and then replaced. The patterns can come from you know, past actions and experiences, either from your current life or from past lives. You know, from a Western perspective, this idea of past lives is sometimes just sort of scoffed at and dismissed. But, you know, try and suspend your judgment there um, and understand that this is a, the Hindu tradition is widespread um, and contains millions and millions of people. So before you dismiss it, um, you know, just remember that. It's assumed that these are echoes, these are mental impressions that are left 
in the mind and that can arise um, from time to time. You know, it could be because you've been stressed or exhausted or overtired or maybe you're living through a pandemic and it's just too much. Um, th these mental impressions that are housed in your subconscious can continue to leak through um, uh, in creating an imbalance between the three elements, uh, the, the sattva, um, the tamas, and the rajas. You know, I refer to them as echoes. Your authors use psychological imprints, whatever phrase works for you. These tendencies can build up um, when the waves of consciousness overwhelm us. Um, you, you, you've had the psychological experience of being overwhelmed in a state of overwhelm where you can't turn off thoughts that are uncomfortable for you. Um, you know, for me, I think about the last time I couldn't sleep because I had anxious thoughts that were just built up and I couldn't shut them out. No matter what I did, I couldn't quiet them. That's what it means to be kind of overwhelmed by waves of consciousness in this tradition. Um, your authors give the example of angry waves of consciousness that create um, a tendency for us to move in the direction of acting out our anger. Um, and that can harm ourselves and it can ha harm other people as well. So the confrontation that has to happen then, you know, is consistent with the goal of yoga, which is reforming consciousness by learning to recognize and confront subconscious tendencies at their root and stopping them from uh, creating waves of consciousness that are difficult for us to control um, and then allowing us to replace them with more sattvic thoughts that are more growth promoting. And that concludes part one of my coverage of yoga and the Hindu tradition.